This is CBC Vancouver News. We need to cover our mouth when we cough. We need to clean our hands regularly. We need to enhance our cleaning in our environment. And these are the things that we do to protect ourselves from getting ill, but also we know that this virus is most likely to be spread to the people who are closest to us. BC's top doctor is urging everyone to do their part to help contain COVID-19. Our province has 11 new cases of coronavirus, 64 in total now. Three are linked to Lionsgate Hospital. Our provincial health officer is banning any gathering larger than 250 people. She's also declaring long-haul truckers essential workers so they can still cross the Canada-U.S. border to move goods and not have to quarantine for 14 days. Dr. Bonnie Henry does encourage people to get outdoors in our province. Meanwhile, the federal government is urging all Canadians to avoid non-essential travel and it will limit inbound flights to try to limit COVID-19. That announcement is prompting some travelers to change their flights and try to get home. The feds are also setting up a multi-billion dollar fund to help businesses struggling under the pandemic and more support is expected next week. The Bank of Canada has also cut its key lending rate. Ottawa is also delaying the cruise ship season until July 1st. And in the U.S., President Donald Trump has declared a national emergency, freeing up billions of dollars for states and local governments to respond to the outbreak. Good evening, I'm Dan Burrett. Mike is away tonight. Closer to home, our Andrea Ross has the latest from health authorities here at the province's briefing today. Andrea, what do we know about these 11 new cases in B.C.? Well, we know they are all connected to the Vancouver coastal health region. Five of them are travel related with ties to Iran, Egypt, the Philippines and Mexico. And we also know there is a cluster of three cases at the Lionsgate Hospital where that's where three administrative staff members have tested positive and the origin of these cases is under investigation. One other case is linked to the Lynn Valley Care Centre in North Vancouver and that's the site of an ongoing outbreak. So a total of 64 people have now been diagnosed with coronavirus in BC. With these new cases, there is a lot of interest in getting tested and that's why urgent care centres are seeing big crowds Here's what one person had to say about their experience at a center on Hornby Street. I'm waiting uh, for hours and it is very exhausted. There is no room inside and it is very nasty inside actually. The province has done more than 6,300 tests so far. Dr. Bonnie Henry says not everyone has to be tested, even if they've come back from traveling. In fact, you don't need to be tested if you're not exhibiting symptoms. And if you are, she says, stay home and monitor yourself. Andrea, Dr. Henry got even more serious about large gatherings today, amongst other things. How is that policy changing? Well, yesterday, Dr. Henry urged organizations to cancel gatherings larger than 250 people. And today, that's an order. No gatherings bigger than 250 people will be permitted in the province for the foreseeable future. And Henry was firm on this today, knowing this will allow people to take the next steps with their insurance. I talked about yesterday making it um, uh, not allowing gatherings over 250 people. Today I'm going to uh, make a provincial health or officer order to make that mandatory and I understand from uh, the, the investigation that we've done into this that that allows people to trigger insurance and other things for, uh, for events that ha have to be cancelled. And as far as traveling goes, BC residents are still urged to reconsider non-essential international travel. The provincial health officer today saying that does not include essential workers like truck drivers and airline staff. Henry says these measures won't be in place forever, but she says it's necessary to stop the spread of the virus and flatten the curve. Thanks very much, Andrea. Andrea Ross reporting live in studio tonight. We have another big development tonight that is affecting tens of thousands of students and faculty across Metro Vancouver. UBC, SFU and now Trinity Western University are moving their courses online for the rest of the semester starting next week. Both UBC and SFU announced the transition to online instructions late this afternoon. SFU President Andrew Petter says while the risk of COVID-19 remains low, they want to help students with social distancing as recommended by the province. He says students will hear from their instructors regarding next steps. 
UBC President Santa Ono, meanwhile, says the COVID-19 situation has become an unprecedented scenario for the university. Campuses will remain open for the semester, and Ono says they aren't aware of any presumptive or confirmed cases of the disease among students or staff. Information on exams are going to be shared next week. And as we said, Trinity Western University classes will be suspended and resume online next Wednesday. Cities around the Lower Mainland gave updates today on what they are doing to minimize the impact of COVID-19 on residents and city operations. Vancouver, Burnaby and Surrey are canceling or postponing events with more than 250 people until further notice. But unlike the city of Toronto, the Lower Mainland's three largest cities will keep their libraries, community and fitness centers, pools, rinks and sports fields open with the exception of steam rooms and saunas in Vancouver. We know how important community facilities and services are and we're taking steps to, to ensure they remain open as long as possible. However, our community services and programs may be adjusted over time as the situation evolves. The city say they will be focused on keeping their facilities clean, but they ask people to keep washing their hands, stay home if they are sick, and practice that social dist distancing. Surrey Mayor Doug McCallum also asks people do not hoard or stockpile supplies because that may mean others who need them are going without essential items. Another massive development came from Ottawa today, namely a caution that Canadians across the country should not leave the country. David Cochran now with the federal government's latest pandemic plans. The Prime Minister is fighting this virus on three fronts. His family's health, the health of Canadians, and the health of the Canadian economy. We will be supporting uh, the economy and Canadians through this time. Because his wife tested positive, Trudeau will work from isolation as his government tries to stop the contagion. Today my advice is to postpone or cancel all non-essential travel outside of Canada. No Canadians should leave the country while the government will limit the ways travellers can enter the country. International arrivals from certain regions will land only at a few specified airports. This will enable us to, to concentrate our, our precious resources for our border services officers and for our public health officers. Cruise ships are banned until at least July. They won't be allowed to go to the Arctic at all because of the lack of health facilities in the north. The border, however, stays open. As evidence shows, a border shutdown doesn't work. I think what we have to remember is that viruses don't know borders. A border is not going to contain the virus. Parliament, though, is closed until late April. MPs of all parties not wanting to be part of the problem when they visit their ridings. We go back and shake thousands of hands. And then 338 people go back, shake thousands of hands, and come back together here, together in the same space. There's the risk to the community, but also the economy. On that front, a highly coordinated response from the country's top financial officials. Cutting interest rates for the second time this month, letting banks tap reserves to free up $300 billion for loans, and offering $10 billion in credit directly to companies. All backstopped by the promise of much more to come. A significant stimulus program to be released next week to stabilize our economy, to support businesses, and to protect Canadians during a difficult time. That will include cash transfers to Canadians as people and the economy adapt to the new restrictions being deployed. It's a significant escalation in the national response and it's nowhere near done because the virus is nowhere near reaching its peak here in Canada. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Still with politics, the pandemic situation has forced first ministers to cancel their meeting. That was set for today. Instead, Premier John Horgan spoke to the PM and other premiers by phone. Concerns over displaced workers, small businesses, and our borders were top of mind. Border crossings, airports, ferry terminals when it comes to Vancouver Island, these are areas where I wanted the federal government to up their game, and I made that pretty clear, and the, the Prime Minister understands that, that British Columbia is perhaps in a unique situation. Morgan is calling for stricter travel measures on American citizens coming into B.C. He categorized the pandemic as an unprecedented period in our history. The coronavirus is officially a national emergency now in the United States. The president made that declaration this afternoon, announcing new measures to fight the illness and stabilize the economy. As Katie Simpson tells us, 
It comes as Donald Trump's administration faces continued scrutiny and criticism for its handling of the outbreak. By declaring a national emergency, the U.S. government will now have access to up to $50 billion in funding that had been put aside for a situation just like this, an emergency. President Donald Trump made the announcement in the White House Rose Garden today alongside members of his coronavirus task force. Some of the money will be used to improve the testing process, which has been terribly slow and deeply problematic in the U.S. The declaration waives certain restrictive regulations, which means more medical professionals can do the tests at more locations. And the government is partnering with the private sector to expand the number of drive-through testing facilities and to set up a website so someone can see if they actually do need a test. We don't want everybody taking this test. It's totally unnecessary. Uh, and this will pass. Uh, this will pass through, and uh, we're going to be uh, even stronger for it. Trump has dramatically changed his tone after repeatedly saying that anyone who wants a test can get one. Right now, in the United States, that is not true. And there is widespread bipartisan criticism of the Trump administration for over-promising the availability of those tests. Trump was asked if he takes personal responsibility for the failure of the testing system, and he said no. No, I don't take responsibility at all because we were given a, uh, a set of circumstances and we were given rules, regulations, and specifications from a different time. Uh, wasn't meant for this kind of uh, an event. Until there is more testing in the U.S., public health officials will not be able to determine the scope of the problem, let alone deal with it. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Traffic at major border crossings and airports has slowed amid the coronavirus outbreak, but some people are traveling through despite warnings from the federal and provincial governments not to leave Canada. Our John Hernandez reports on why some travelers are defying that request. The halls of Vancouver International Airport, eerily quiet. It's unusual, and it's so quiet around here. This is the first time I see such a quiet airport. Coming here, there's a lot of empty seats, and it was a lot more quiet. Canadians have been advised not to leave the country amid the COVID-19 outbreak. Some defiantly soldiering on. Oh, we're going on a wedding. My sister's, um, my nephew's wedding. So we're going to take precautions as is. A lot of, like, hand washing and wiping and everything. It's a catch-22 for me because I, I also work in healthcare. A decision that registered nurse Nancy Dlovu has grappled with for the last 24 hours. Travel is my work and I'm traveling to help other people. So it's difficult for me to say no. Um, I am taking precautions uh, for myself and just uh, to protect other people. And those who arrive in Canada are asked to self-quarantine for two weeks. A public warning that's news to many tourists. So we have to self-isolate here for 14 days? Yeah. Um, yeah, the, that wasn't really on the agenda. A lot of people visiting here now scrambling to get home, unsure what new travel restrictions could soon be imposed. I can't even get on hold, so I had to come here in person and also um, try and get my flight changed. But in that meantime, I also just want to get home today, so I booked another flight. Meanwhile, traffic at major border crossings has dwindled. Here at Peace Arch, just a five-minute wait compared to the hours-long lineups you'd usually see on a Friday. Here in British Columbia, we're still concerned about points of entry. Still, Premier John Horgan is calling on Ottawa to up its game when it comes to stopping the spread into Canada. As more cases trickle into B.C., health officials say a growing number can be traced back to the U.S. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. We'll have much more on coronavirus later on in our program, but to other news now. Police have arrested a suspect after a teacher was violently attacked this morning at a high school in Surrey. As our Mickey Cowan reports, the assault forced L.A. Matheson Secondary into a lockdown. 17-year-old Braden Smith was laying in bed when he saw the news on the L.A. Matheson High School app. I was like, shocks. 
his school on lockdown due to a police incident. Sources tell CBC a Spanish teacher was stabbed and sent to hospital where he's in stable condition. Wow, be like, he's such a nice teacher. Because like, I know friends like are close to him and like really like him. There was a massive police response. At least 21 RCMP vehicles called to the scene. The incident happened about an hour before classes were scheduled to start. So RCMP say there were few people at the school when it happened. But there were witnesses. They helped police track down a suspect by this afternoon, arresting a 19-year-old Surrey man. Officers say he's not a current or former Matheson student, although the attack was targeted. Constable Richard Wright says incidents like this can be traumatic for the neighbourhood. That's why we have our victim services and that's why our investigators will be reaching out to anyone that's been affected. Vehicles were turned away from the school all morning and few people were let inside. Bob Bassey's cousins go to the school. He came by to see what happened. I was shocked. I mean, I thought, honestly, first I thought it was a shooting before a stabbing because everything that's going on in Syria right now in uh, Lower Mainland, and I thought it was a shooting. The stabbing's pretty, uh, stabbing or shooting, it's, it's, uh, it's sad. Matheson is a school that CBC Vancouver featured in a series on Surrey school life and the stigma over violence that often follows Surrey students. This latest incident, another challenge. The school district declined our request for comment, so we don't know how it's planning to help the students and staff who have now started their spring break early in a most unexpected and alarming way. Mickey Cowan, CBC News, Surrey. Just a reminder, you can watch this newscast live on CBC Gym. That free app is also where you can find other great CBC programs. CBC Vancouver is also on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Coming up, a tale of two cities. Why are Seattle and Vancouver's coronavirus experiences so different? That's next. Thanks for joining us on our Facebook live stream. We've been hearing a lot about people being told to self isolate but it doesn't always mean locking yourself into a sealed chamber for example you saw the prime minister standing outside his home today a safe distance from the reporters gathered there but what if you have to self-isolate ellen morrow shows us what precautions you can take more and more people are in self-isolation at home either because they have the virus worries they could be carrying it or as a precaution this is what you should do if you find yourself in that position First things first, you're not leaving your home unless you need medical care. Don't go to the store, get on public transportation, in a taxi, you're staying inside. If you live with others, you need to keep your distance from them. You should also stay away from any pets you might have. Stay in a separate room, use a separate bathroom if possible, and if you are in the same space, you should wear a mask and they should also wear gloves. Keep any interactions limited and you should stay at least two meters apart. You or if there's someone else in your home needs to be disinfecting regularly touched surfaces as much as possible, so counters and taps, and make sure you're not sharing any dishes with anyone who's sick or may be infected. For laundry, officials say there's no need to separate people's clothes, but they should be handled with gloves, and you should use the highest temperatures possible. Afterwards, you need to wash your hands with soap and water. You should be doing that frequently, as well as monitoring your symptoms. And since you must limit your interactions, keep in touch with your loved ones through your phone. You also need to keep busy. Many people will be working from home. You could also do that task you've been putting off, read a book, watch a new show. Mental health is important. Make sure you're taking care of yourself. You might need to get creative, use a grocery delivery app, or have your friends drop things off outside since you can't go to a store. Anything you can do to keep yourself away from others as much as possible. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. Good advice. Stay with us. We'll, later this hour, we're going to take your questions on COVID-19's impact on your mental health. Stick around for that. And send us your questions now. We're going to put them to our expert coming up in about 20 minutes.
The weather update is brought to you by The Body Shop that always takes you back to your happy place. BC's favorite, Craftsman Collision, Air Miles, and Bigger Smiles. Brett Soderholm is here with a look at the weather after... I don't know how to describe this week. It, it has been a week. I mean, just unprecedented in so many ways. Mm -hmm. And even the weather has been kind of doing some strange things. And that trend is still going to be applying for all of us here in Vancouver as we go into the weekend. Tomorrow, just cutting straight to the point here, it's going to probably feel a little bit more reminiscent of January. It's going to be a pretty chilly day. But the weekend as a whole is still going to be all right because come Sunday, it is going to be feeling a little bit more spring-like. Right now, across the region, we're dealing with just a few spotty showers here there. There's been some localized snow as well falling as we speak across southern portions of Vancouver Island and temperatures are not really all that exciting at this point in time. Lots of six degrees out there and that is going to be lucky to be our temperature that we get up to tomorrow. In terms of what we're dealing with though, one of the major stories right now is going to be the wind. I've already noticed places like Abbotsford gusting up to 70 kilometers an hour today and near Howe Sound that's reached already 80. So for these regions we are still expecting local gusts to go up to about 90 kilometers an hour tonight and this applies for Victoria as well as our central coast so this as of right now isn't impacting the ferries too much but if you are considering making your way over to the island do be mindful to check the schedule there in terms of our winds just watch this these are coming from the northeast so this is going to be bringing a lot of colder air down from the Arctic with it in places like Abbotsford throughout the day tomorrow still a really gusty place in the Fraser Valley anywhere between 60 and 80 kilometers an hour is possible and here in Vancouver expect more of an eastern wind so still feeling relatively on the cool side but we're not going to have really any precipitation to deal with the precip is all going to be falling really across parts of the Okanagan and largely it's going to be the Kootenays we are expecting anywhere between 5 to 10 centimeters of snow accumulating over the next 24 hours but watch this as I zoom out for Sunday there is not a little bit of precipitation to be found anywhere across the province from Victoria up to Fort Nelson it is going to be dry and it is going to be sunny that said temperatures tomorrow I mentioned a little bit on the chilly side three degrees in Abbotsford that is closer to January like and by the time we get to Sunday it'll rebound a little bit now here's something you probably haven't seen in case you're going to be sticking around changing up those spring break plans next week is going to be an excellent one to be in town it is chilly as I mentioned on Saturday but Sunday all the way through Wednesday lots of sunshine and I wouldn't be surprised to see these temperatures maybe even get to 15 degrees by Wednesday that might be enjoyable after this week I would say so thanks very much Brett you're welcome well, concerns about COVID-19 caused organizers to cancel this year's BC Junior All-Native Basketball Championship in Kelowna next week. More than 80 BC Indigenous teams, including four urban Indigenous teams from here in Vancouver, were set to play in that big tournament. The CBC's Urban Nations Unit met up with the under-13 Indigenous girls team from East Vancouver. To them, belonging means more than just being on a team. Van City is a, is a unique Indigenous community I don't think exists anywhere. My name is Nicole Cardinal and I'm the, one of the managers with the Van City Grizzlies girls basketball team. Our girls come from uh, around the Lower Mainland. We have girls that live in East Vancouver. I know some of our girls commute from Surrey um, and they go to, vari they go to various yeah. schools. So it's a parent-funded team. And so a lot of the challenges is raising the funds throughout the year, finding gym space uh, to practice in, and um, that, that, that challenge doesn't seem to go away. And one thing that um, helps motivate me to want to win something is the fact that everyone has a stereotype for East Van saying how bad it is and it's not very well and how people always think that we're going to end up on the streets. But I want to show them that there's a good side of East Bend, that we know how to behave and we know how to play basketball. I understand where these girls come from, the struggles we face as Indigenous, young Indigenous girls. People just say, you're going to drop out of school, you're going to be pregnant, you know? Like, that's what I was told when I was in grade nine. And I fought that. And I'm so happy to be able to not only 
be a player on this team when I was 12 years old, but to be on the other side of that now and share my teachings and my knowledge, not just around basketball, but life skills too with these girls. One of the things I focus on um, is to keeping our girls safe, giving them ball of what they love, but also instilling that pride. Uh, I tell them when we do go to any tournament, the community here supports them. And they represent us, plus their community, plus their family, so we still have the cultural teachings attached to that. There we go, right away, right away, right away. I don't want these girls to ever not feel proud of who they are. And and they don't, and it's a beautiful thing. So to have them realize that this is a gift and that all these parents, the managers, the coaches, nobody's paid to do this. We do this all on our own time so they can have that and look sharp in their warm-ups as they do. <laughs> if you're feeling anxious, you're not alone. Coming up, we're going to pose your questions to a psychologist on how to cope in this time of Big uncertainty. Email us, cbcnewsvancouver at cbc.ca or call that number, 604-662-6801. Your questions after this. These designated testing sites, why is having them important in this country? They're imperative because one of the big worries about COVID-19 is that if we have lots of cases in a short period of time, it could overwhelm the healthcare system. And what this does is this takes a lot of pressure off the emergency departments. In the last several weeks, patients have been going to the emergency department to get tested. And, you know, many of these people, thankfully, are not that ill, but you can see that it's volume added to their already big caseload. So these clinics will allow us to offload that, get testing done quickly in a streamlined manner and it's really going to help and they're popping up all over the country. Yeah, there's one in Montreal, there's plans to open some in Ontario, elsewhere in Quebec and Alberta as well. How do they operate? Like what, how do they work? So uh, some of them are a little bit different than the other, but in, in general what happens is you have a specialized area that has the ability to isolate patients, so they're not, of course, sitting in one big waiting area that they could potentially infect each other. The staff is protected, and this is specialized for this, so the, the people are then tested with a swab. Also, we can have certain video capabilities in some of the clinics where they can look at the patient and go, well, maybe that patient needs to come into the hospital rather than go home. So it, it, it also has ability to test for other viruses as well, not just COVID-19. So people who are sick, we're also monitoring influenza, for example. It's another good way of, of getting that testing. So it's kind of like an uh, all-in-one, uh, one-stop shop, if you will. Mm. And it's something that's really, really helpful for the outbreak. It's, it's going to be instrumental. And there's discretion with the doctor in terms of who gets tested? Uh, that is the case, but that is rapidly changing. So, for example, the beginning of the outbreak, we would only test people, for example, that came back from certain countries like China or Iran. Right. But rapidly we're seeing that there's now it's any travel, and now eventually we're going to be starting to have anybody with respiratory symptoms, and certainly a number of hospitals in the, the, the greater Toronto area that I could speak for have been doing that. So the testing is quite broad, and we're trying to capture everybody to be able to get ahead of this. And if you get a test done in one of these uh, remote clinics, one of the, the designated centers, how long does it take until you, you figure out the results? It can come back very quickly. So in my experience, at least at my hospital, when we have done them, some of these tests have been coming back in 24 hours. Wow. Everybody is really, really on top of this. So it's, uh, it's just only going to be better. And I have to commend our uh, infection control and uh, public health uh, practitioners across Canada because this has been a really strong, coordinated effort. It's interesting. In Alberta last week, the chief medical officer there said that they're going to look at retesting older influenza samples in that province for COVID-19. What do you make of, of that? That's right. So the, the reason for doing that is one of the problems, for example, with Italy was that they discovered the outbreak when it was already in the uptick, that exponential increase. And that's why it was, they were already in the midst of the outbreak when they discovered it. One of the things that we're trying to avoid here in Canada, learning from other places, is if you look back at some of these samples, you can get an idea, well, look, were there cases of COVID-19 before already circulating, and we didn't know about it? 
So far, there's no evidence of that. And what we're doing is testing not only people that are presenting, but we're also going out searching for them across the country as well. And so far, there has not been any evidence of community transmission apart from in BC. And uh, we're looking at some cases in, in uh, Ontario right now. Should that retesting be happening all across the country? Uh, it depends on the situation, but it's something that's being discussed among uh, the microbiologists and infectious disease practitioners. We need to cover our mouth when we cough. We need to clean our hands regularly. We need to enhance our cleaning in our environment. And these are the things that we do to protect ourselves from getting ill, but also we know that this virus is most likely to be spread to the people who are closest to us. BC's top doctor is urging everyone to do their part to help contain COVID-19. Our province has 11 new cases of coronavirus, 64 in total now. Three are linked to Lionsgate Hospital. Our provincial health officer is banning any gathering larger than 250 people. She's also declaring long-haul truckers essential workers so they can still cross the Canada-U.S. border to move goods and not have to quarantine for 14 days. Dr. Bonnie Henry does encourage people to get outdoors in our province. Meanwhile, the federal government is urging all Canadians to avoid non-essential travel and it will limit inbound flights to try to limit COVID-19. That announcement is prompting some travelers to change their flights and try to get home. The feds are also setting up a multi-billion dollar fund to help businesses struggling under the pandemic and more support is expected next week. The Bank of Canada has also cut its key lending rate. Ottawa is also delaying the cruise ship season until July 1st. And in the U.S., President Donald Trump has declared a national emergency, freeing up billions of dollars for states and local governments to respond to the outbreak. With Seattle and Vancouver just 200 kilometers apart, the two cities have taken two very different approaches to tackling COVID-19 with strikingly different outcomes. Washington State announced 111 new cases just today. B.C., just 11. Ian Hannah-Mansing went down there to find out why. There you go. In the state hardest hit by COVID-19 came one of the strongest warnings this week. We are going to have to change our lives in ways that are uncomfortable if we're going to succeed as a community. It's not quite lockdown in Seattle, but residents say it's pretty close. Our office is pretty much empty. I'm only in for, uh, for one meeting today and then I'll go home. I think that's pretty much citywide. Ground zero in the state is the Life Care Centre. 22 people connected to the facility have died after contracting COVID-19. More than half of the current residents have tested positive. And the virus has spread well beyond here. Let me just show you this so we can... Dow Constantine is the chief executive of King County, which includes Seattle. There are almost 300 confirmed cases here, and Constantine says that number will likely double every five to seven days. I am concerned for my community and, and what this will do over the long term. Obviously, the personal tragedies that are happening every day are, uh, are terrible. And the impact to our economy, to our culture, to the cultural institutions that will be challenged to survive uh, is, you know, remains to be seen, but is potentially really severe. It has been widely reported that Washington state was slow to test for the virus, losing valuable weeks in identifying who had it and how it was spreading. There are now more than 500 confirmed cases and 37 people have died. But after falling behind, the state has moved quickly, from big companies telling employees to work from home, government banning major sports events before leagues took action, and big institutions like the University of Washington, which developed and is administering hundreds of COVID-19 tests a day. Keith Jerome is the university's head of virology. Yeah, well, I think what's really struck me is how quickly you can go from this being an abstract concern to this being essentially all you think about in a location. Jerome's university closed classroom doors on Monday. Students are now learning online. But take a look at the University of British Columbia today where classes with fewer than 250 students are still meeting. One of the many distinctions between the impact of COVID-19 in Vancouver and Seattle. It is striking. You see cities that are so close to each other 
in their geography, so similar to each other in their demographics, but you see very different outbreaks. In places like Wuhan, there was a huge... Vancouver doctor Srinivas Murthy is working with the World Health Organization on COVID-19. He says one of the differences in early response to the outbreak between Seattle and Vancouver was based on access to health care. If you can't have community level coverage, which is completely across the board for everybody, you won't be able to solve the outbreak. Providing excellent care to a few people um, is not a solution to outbreak response. You need to be across the board. And that's why a universal health system in Canada approaches that obviously much more so than the United States. Our healthcare system is famously fragmented and extraordinarily expensive. Uh, the Canadian system is more comprehensive, but it'll still become overwhelmed. There's a very elaborate system. Of course, that's what officials are trying to fend off on both sides of the border, even if in Washington the fight seems, at least for now, a little more daunting. For all of our admonitions to keep a safe distance from others and work from home, we end up coming to work. We are at my office building today. And I will tell you that we've already identified that someone who was in this building is positive for the coronavirus. So you have to avoid touching things, you have to wash continually, you have to not touch your face, and you have to keep those who are most vulnerable away from infection. That is the most critical thing. And if we do these things and we do them earnestly and, and zealously, we will get through this. And since this story first aired, we know that UBC, SFU, Trinity Western, and now UVic have gone to online learning as of next week. We've seen BC's top doctor emerge as one of the faces and very calm voices of this pandemic. Ian sat down with Dr. Bonnie Henry earlier today, and he began by asking about the sudden increase in restrictions. It really came down to feeling that we, the, the changing situation globally, the changing risk, um, that it would be better to go too soon than too late. And if we went too late and didn't protect people, we would never be able to recover from that. A lot has been emphasized about what we can't do or shouldn't do. Here we are on a Friday night heading into a, a Saturday. What can we do? Yeah, so that's it. We, we, we want to find that balance of protecting people as best we can and protecting our communities and particularly our seniors and elders. But we need to live life and society has to go on and we want to minimize as much as possible the disruption. So there's lots of things we can do. We're not closing down society and we're not closing down outdoor things. I mean, this is a perfect time to go walking in the park, <laughs> go with your, with your kids, go, go skiing, go um, visit ski hills, go to restaurants, go out. Um, but just be mindful. And if you're not feeling well yourself, stay away. And stay away from people who might be more vulnerable. This is a time where we do have some transmission here in BC. We have some transmission in our communities. So people who are older, who have underlying illnesses, need to really consider about going out in a crowded place. And that's what some of these measures are, to try and reduce that crowding. You said earlier that better to be too early on some of these measures than too late. How would you assess as of right now the level of risk of transmission in British Columbia? Yeah, right now and most of BC, our level of risk is quite low still. Still quite low? Still quite low. We have some community cases that we have not yet traced back and figured out where they are, but small numbers. And we're doing a lot of testing, so we have a pretty good idea. Having said that, you know, the testing is, is getting near its maximum and it's challenging and we, have, we still have quite a lot of people who are sick. Some of the other things in, that we were thinking about, you know, March break starts today, at the end of the school day today for many kids, and it's for the next two weeks. And a lot of people were planning on travel, and that concerned me, particularly if we were traveling to places where we now know there's a lot more risk than we realized even a day or 24 hours ago. So uh, the impetus really for, for making these decisions yesterday was so that people were aware of these things when they went on travel, they could reconsider whether they wanted to go to places, um, particularly because the risk is changing so quickly everywhere in the world. Last question, you said things are changing so quickly here day to day, so maybe not a fair question, but what do you think is next? Yeah, so what do I think is next or what do I hope is next? <laughs> yeah, we're in this for an another few weeks at least. 
um, given what's happening globally. Particularly, I'm worried about what's going on in Europe, and we're now seeing seeding of countries in, in South America and other places that we haven't seen before. So it's not over yet by any means. I'm uh, hopeful, and we will continue to do as much containment as we can in BC, but I s expect that we'll have more community transmission. I hope that we'll be able to slow it down and keep it so that our our healthcare system is able to manage and able to look after everybody else who has their health issues as well. Um, but I think we have a number of weeks before we can really predict what this is what this is going to look like. Well, you've done a very good job in getting the message out. So thank you very much. Thank you. Despite the assured and calm tones of Dr. Bonnie Henry, it's safe to say people are feeling anxious. We're going to speak with a psychologist next and answer your questions on how to find peace of mind. Email us right now, cbcnewsvancouver at cbc.ca or call the number on your screen, 604-662-6801. Stick around. For the next few minutes and again after the break, we are going to answer your questions about the mental health component of COVID-19, how to cope with anxiety and how to talk to your children if you have them, if they're feeling worried as well. You can ask your questions by email now or over the phone or contact us on Facebook, YouTube or Twitter. We've already received lots of them and we're going to try and answer as many as possible. Joining us now is Sonia Latifpour. She is a registered social worker. Sonia, thank you for joining us. Let's dive right in. How common a reaction is anxiety? when it comes to dealing with a pandemic like this? It, it's common, but in, in this case, there is um, a lot of anxiety um, that children are seeing from adults, whether it is buying a lot of groceries, whether it is um, not attending school or needing to stay home. Uh, we know from children that they are great observers, but not very good at interpreting. So children are left with bits and pieces of information without context, which is very scary for them. How, what, what are some of the common ways that parents can fill in those gaps so to give children context and reassure them? So one of them is to just to first to listen to your child. What does your child know about COVID-19? Where, where are they at? Where are they at? And then beginning to give little bits of information. So not to flood them with anxiety, but these little bits of piece of information followed up with reassurances and focusing on what we do know about 
the situation and things that we can do, which would be uh, hand washing, which would be coughing in your in your elbow. Um, all those things are I important mm -hmm. to contextualize for, for children. Now, Ali on Facebook has a question. How can we foster a sense of community while practicing social distancing? That's not easy. No, it, it is not. And that might mean um, being with, uh, connecting with friends while you're playing a video game. It might be uh, Skype, through Skype or FaceTime. I mean, we know teens are fantastic with social media. So there's already a, a platform that kids are used to uh, using to interact with each other. Izzy on Facebook asks as well, how should we make sure our isolated neighbors who live alone are okay if we don't see them for a while? You could, you could call, you could, um, I mean, in terms of, of, of children, um, you, you, would, you would really connect them with um, knowing what, who in our community are our helpers. So this would be police, um, paramedics, doctors, and really um, reinforcing the idea that are, there are people out there who can care for um, our elderly, for people who are sick, and they're really good at their jobs. So that a child is given the sense that there are people who um, can take care of those that they are worried about. Now, anxiety, we know, can climb up all the way sometimes, unfortunately, into, into panic attacks. For those who are experiencing those either with children or perhaps teenagers or somebody else in their house, regardless of their age, can you give us a few steps on how to de-escalate that situation? So breathing, just to calm the body down, because when we are in a panicked state, we are no longer thinking clearly. So the first is to take deep breaths, calm the body down, perhaps using a wet washcloth, a red, uh, a cold washcloth, and then talking to the child about things that we know about. So things that um, they can hang on to to, to, to ground themselves. Um, one great exercise is um, helping the child remember five things they see, four things they hear, three things they smell, two things they taste. So to go through that exercise to, to ground them and to get them out of this cycle of, of worrying thoughts. When it comes to perhaps a spouse or another loved one, one of the concerns we're hearing a lot, particularly online, is about money. For people who may be in the gig economy, who are concerned about paying bills, whether they're uh, younger people, what are some advice, uh, pieces of advice you would have for parents who may be speaking with university students who are anxious about that part-time job that, that may be up in the air right now? How, uh, how can they be helped? Well, one thing is to stay present to, to the now. And anxiety is all about future thinking. So right now, we need to focus on what we're doing now to keep ourselves healthy, to keep others in our community healthy, and to reassure uh, students or, or teens that this will be conversations that, that can be had when, when we know more. So whether it is a, a two-week isolation or self-isolation period, or whether this is longer, there's many factors that make it difficult to give certain answer, which is part of the, the panic is this uncertainty. Okay. And again, let's go back to parents for a moment. They have a very tough job, particularly with younger children, as you said, who may be struggling with context and filling in those gaps. Again, what are some of those basic rules that parents can use to help calm the children down and keep themselves calm? That's a hard thing to do. Yes, and, and the parents are a big part of keeping a child um, feelings of, of, of safety. So really as an, as an adult monitoring, perhaps your social media checking, we had someone in the, in the clinic just yesterday of a little girl who was very anxious because she kept hearing her, her mother's, um, n news notifications every, every half hour. So that was causing her a lot of anxiety. So really, um, being, really keeping an eye on when you have the radio playing or the, um, the, the TV on that there are, little children or there's children around who are listening to all of this and they need that time for uh, a grown-up to sit down with them and to ex explain the, the facts of what they know. Very good advice. Sonia Latifpour, registered social worker. We really appreciate your time and your insight. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you. Stay with us. We're going to have more on COVID-19 and the rest of news coming up.
For Friday prayers at this Montreal mosque, extra precautions and a careful headcount. We try to respect the consideration which has been delivered by the government to not have more than 250, and we are counting with this our counters. The Canadian Council of Imams recommended cancelling Friday prayers, and some mosques did. Those coming here say they are being cautious. The brothers, like, they made special efforts to clean up everything that is touched by multiple people, uh, like the places where people do do is also very clean. This Montreal synagogue also says it won't allow more than 250 people at its services and will ask people to sit at a distance from one another. The Catholic Archdiocese of Montreal and Toronto asked their churches to cancel Sunday Masses. At this church, only smaller weekday services are going ahead. I enjoy coming here. It's still, it's something I, I think it's going to help us and uh, go through everything we're going through in there right now. The Montreal Diocese says funerals, baptisms and weddings can still be held as long as attendance is scaled back. At Montreal's St. Joseph's Oratory, where pilgrims normally come by the thousands this time of year, all masses are cancelled, with some held online. It was a very difficult decision because the uh, celebration of the Eucharist, the mass, is really the, the core of our prayer life as Catholic, and uh, to, uh, to abandon this is very painful. In Rome, one cardinal was forced to go back on his decision to close 900 churches after the Pope warned against drastic measures some Catholics called putting Christ in quarantine. In Greece, there's been heated debate in the Orthodox Church around the Holy Communion, where many worshippers use the same chalice. My opinion is that faith strengthens your immune system, says this worshipper. If you really believe, you won't catch it. Having faith is good, but it's not going to save you from a virus, he says. Even without services, some say they'll find other ways to practice their faith throughout this crisis. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. As our guest moments ago just told us, shopping and panic buying has many people anxious. Grocery stores are dealing with long lineups and empty shelves across this country amid fears over the outbreak. Worried shoppers are rushing to grab essentials and other things ahead of things possibly getting worse. As Nazima Walji reports, experts say preparing for the pandemic doesn't have to involve panic. Crowds of shoppers worried about COVID-19 are heading to stores in droves loading up on items like toilet paper, hand sanitizer, canned goods, and much more, leaving many shelves empty. They're running out of things in there. It's amazing. My wife was looking for lemons. There's no such thing as a lemon in there. It's quite, quite extraordinary. I'm actually in a high-risk group, and I'm old. Yeah, excuse me. Anxiety over cancelled events and news of celebrities testing positive has been adding to the already growing fears, causing panic buying across the country. Outside a superstore in Calgary, the parking lot full, people stockpiling. It's a good idea to get what you can while you can. Kind of a madhouse right now. And at a Costco in Quebec. I saw people with like five, six packages of toilet paper. This is what we call hurting behavior. Uh, I, I don't think it's surprising people do that. Uh, it's very normal. Behavior uh, specialist Yuma says it's natural for people to want to be prepared in times of elevated pressure but doesn't think it's time yet for Canadians to worry. Canada is a big man, I mean, big uh, exporter of food, so I'm less concerned about food than compared to other countries. In an effort to alleviate stress and the surge in panic buying in Quebec, the Premier reassured Quebecers. Right now, we don't expect any uh, shortage. So I think that uh, this is not necessary. Ma warns against buying too much at once. They don't have to be panicked. It's good to be prepared, but uh, just don't, you don't have to buy Renalex for three months or four months of supply. Suggesting buying in large quantities can make it harder for grocery stores to restock shelves. He says to instead only buy a little extra every time you shop, so there's enough for everyone. Nazima Walji, CBC News, Toronto. The U.S. president has said COVID-19 took the world by surprise, but researchers at a leading American university say it did not. 
Armed with reams of data and cold, hard math months ago, they modeled how an outbreak like this would unfold. As Adrian Arsenault found, the virus is behaving exactly as predicted in that simulated crisis. This board has been urgently convened by the World Economic Forum. It was a new coronavirus and spreading fast, killing 7% of those infected. We could be looking at double the number of cases in one week. That was the drastic fictional scenario drilled at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore last October with health and industry officials from around the world imagining the what ifs. I worry we're suffering from a delusional disorder. If they contribute more, that they will have a, a better chance. You need the money, so where's the money? Within eight weeks, it had all happened. The real COVID-19 is less lethal, but the disruptions are exactly as anticipated. The stock plunges, stranded cruise ships, canceled events, all unfolding on schedule as they did in the simulation. Back in October, made up newscasts told the stories. Public health agencies have issued travel advisories. Dr. Eric Toner ran the October simulation, said it was clear then to all the nations participating that travel bans didn't work, caused enormous economic harm. In the simulation, a few countries still went ahead with them, but not many. What did you think when you heard the president's uh, travel ban? Well, I think travel bans are ill-advised. They are counterproductive. They certainly would not do anything useful currently. There's plenty of COVID-19 in the United States. So were you mad? Um, I was disappointed. I think we've been focused on the, the idea that we could contain the disease elsewhere, keep it out of this country. I think that was obviously not true from the very beginning. Um, and we should have been spending the last two months getting prepared. The future? Johns Hopkins runs an hourly interactive map of the infections. Watch North America, France, and Germany to change fast, Dr. Toner says. An infection rate doubling roughly every week, just as predicted. That was The National's co-host, Adrian Arsenault, reporting from John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore.
you can always find our news program online at cbc.ca slash bc. I'll be here with your next local news at 11 o'clock right after the national. We're going to end with some music. Italy's 60 million residents are dealing with a countrywide lockdown, but they're finding creative ways to share. This is a street in Siena filled with music as people sang from their windows in a show of community. Enjoy. Good night. Yeah.